All right, let's get into carbonyl reactivity. Before we jump into any examples, let's understand the nature of the carbonyl. So here's a general carbonyl. Now oxygen has two lone pairs, and because of its electronegativity, it tends to extract electron density from the carbonyl carbon. So that makes this area of the carbonyl, the carbon, electrophilic or partially positive. And because of this electron withdrawal from the carbon to oxygen, there's a bias of electron density on this carbonyl oxygen, and we consider that partially negative. So understanding that is crucial because this partially positive center on the carbonyl is susceptible to nucleophilic attack. And generally, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. And we see that here because there's less steric hindrance. This carbon-hydrogen bond is relatively small, and the hydrogen itself is a very small atom, so it poses no steric effects on any incoming nucleophiles. If we compare two similar carbonyls, for example, acetone and the related aldehyde acetaldehyde, acetone by far is less reactive. Now, one way to compare reactivity is with the K equilibrium constant in the context of a particular reaction, okay? So here we're using hydration, where the reaction goes from, let's say, a standard carbonyl to a hydrate compound, where the carbonyl is considered the reactant and the hydrate is the product. So we know from general chem that products over reactants in terms of their concentration gives us the K equilibrium constant. And the larger the concentration of product at equilibrium, the greater the K value, meaning the forward reaction is favored. This reaction is reversible, but may be considered irreversible depending on this K constant, and we'll see some examples. So again, K hydration is concentration of product over concentration of reactant. So based on this hydration reaction, acetone's K value is 1 times 10 to negative 3, and acetaldehyde is just flat 1. So a huge difference in reactivity, even though both compounds are quite similar. The only difference is one methyl group. So aside from all of this, let's look at other factors that determine carbonyl reactivity. One is the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon. Now we said that's influenced by the oxygen, but that's always present in the carbonyl. So obviously we have other groups that are adjacent that influence this partial positive charge. So let's look at one example here. If we're given the following compounds, so this is butanol, and we compare that to two other butanol derivatives. But the only difference here is that at the beta carbon, I put chlorine. On the alpha carbon, I put chlorine. And then here, I just don't put anything. So this is just my pure carbonyl. How do we predict the reactivity? Just like oxygen pulls electron density towards itself, chlorine is almost on par in terms of electronegativity with oxygen. So it will pull electron density towards itself. This is not really a dipole arrow, but just to show that. The same thing happens here. Chlorine pulls electron density towards itself, and here, there's none of that effect. So it would follow that the closer the electronegative group is to the carbonyl carbon, the stronger the inductive effect is. In other words, the polarizing effect of this chlorine is more intense the closer it is to the carbonyl. So here, this compound's more reactive than this and than this. Another major factor is steric hindrance, which is a more straightforward concept. If we compare, just like we did before, acetone versus acetaldehyde, merely drawing out the two compounds shows us which one is more reactive, because this carbonyl carbon is more readily available to nucleophiles based on steric hindrance. A more extreme example would be acetophenone versus benzaldehyde. So here, acetophenone is a benzene directly bound to an acetyl group like this. So we have a methyl on one side and a benzene on the other. Benzaldehyde 
however, lacks a methyl group. So again, the presence of this methyl or hydrogen influences the reactivity tremendously. Benzaldehyde is actually quite reactive. Acetophenol, not as much. Now the last concept that kind of ties in steric effects and electron withdrawal and donation and the idea of polarization of the carbonyl is this idea of hyperconjugation. It has this long definition, you can read it, but I'm going to try to illustrate it with something you guys know about carbocations. So we know that primary carbocations are extremely unstable and essentially don't exist. If we look at this propyl carbocation, this may exist, but it's also very unstable. But for sure, tertiary carbocations are even more stable. Now, why is that? We said as a rule of thumb, if you add more substitution on the carbocation, it becomes more stable. So a tertiary is more stable than secondary, more stable than primary. But this is the reason. It's this electronic interaction between this greater amount of substitution that stabilizes the positive charge. And here's why. If we draw out this tert-butyl carbocation, we'll put the positively charged carbocation in the center. It's bound to a methyl group on the right and two other methyl groups towards the left. And we know that the orbital configuration here on this specific carbon is sp2 hybridized meaning it puts out three of these sp2 hybrid orbitals that could be bound to other adjacent carbons or hydrogens. So here's an sp2 orbital, here's another, here's another. A consequence of that is we have an empty non-bonding p orbital, which is unfilled, no electrons. Now how is this stabilized? Because it is tertiary, it's bound to three other carbons. Well, it's this interaction between the empty non-bonding orbital and the adjacent carbon-hydrogen sigma bond right here that promotes the stabilization of this empty p orbital and this positive charge in general. So if I were to expand this bond to make it look a little more realistic, something like this, which is then bound to a hydrogen, like so, and it's simply the fact that this carbon-hydrogen sigma bond is directly adjacent to our charge and empty p orbital that promotes the stabilization. And we show that right here. So what we have is an extended, more stable molecular orbital. Now how does that relate to carbonyls? Well, by virtue of this concept, and this also applies to radicals, remember, we can look at different carbonyls and judge them on the basis of their reactivity. So if we look at this propyl carbonyl, immediately we know that acetaldehyde is more reactive because on the left we just have a methyl. Here we have a larger ethyl group that to some extent attenuates the reactivity of the carbonyl carbon, making it less electrophilic. So in this question we need to rank the following carbonyl compounds in terms of decreasing reactivity towards hydrate formation. So we don't really need to know the K hydration values at all. We just need to find the most reactive and place that first. So if we look here, here's benzaldehyde, here is formaldehyde, here's acetophenone, here's a modified acetaldehyde, we have three fluorines, fluorine is the most electronegative atom, so it looks like this is most reactive, and we have the analog of that acetaldehyde. So this modified acetaldehyde is most reactive, so we put that as number one. Because of that we can eliminate some choices, Another tip is to look for the least reactive, the most sterically hindered, the compound with the most amount of hyperconjugation, the compound with the most electron donation towards the carbonyl carbon. And the obvious choice here is acetophenone. We'll call that 5. So we look for the choice that has 3, and it's right here. So based on all the factors, all the theoretical basis, we're able to determine a ranking system when we're given many different kinds of carbonyls.